it's recording now. Good. Okay. So once again, uh, welcome to uh, Nature Language Processing with Deep Learning. And I guess we met already with pretty much everybody yesterday, I guess, here. So this is great. Hope to see you here again. And this lecture is introductory, a introductory lecture where we kind of start thinking what is, uh, so we have in the title, Nature Language Processing with Deep Learning. So what is Nature Language Processing and why we need deep learning to do so, in the, to do Nature Language Processing. And from what I remember, you most of you didn't have any, don't have any prior experience with natural language processing. So I think you're right here today. So we learned something about NLP and why is it why is it interesting? Why is it challenging? Okay. If you have any questions, just ask. You know. So let's get started. And since I'm using a new tool, I'm just curious how that's gonna work. So okay, good motivation. Okay. So what is the best motivation for doing NLP? Uh, we talked about it yesterday. I have just a single answer, you know, this is it. Like, there is a reason why we should be concerned as a computer scientist about natural language processing and especially these lar large language models such as GPT-4 and other Slama co-pilot and stuff like that. So this is this is reason number one. And other people have different reasons like, well, I like languages and, and, and things and this is fine too. So, so in this course we'll be, I think we'll start with really like little little tiny steps because I want you to understand really all the nitty gritty details of of the the deep learning things that are under all these large language models. So we you know we cannot start like okay let's take ChatGPT and do something with that and just start you know start exploring. It's like I don't know like the analogy. I don't like the analogy with the brain, but it would be like we should start understanding what the neuron makes in order to understand the brain, but not start like you know peeking here in the brain to understand how, how it works. So something like that. So this is the this is the roadmap, more or less, but it's subject to change. So we'll see how far we how far we go. Okay. So something along these lines, we should be able to end up with transformer models and uh, uh, in context learning and then maybe some other I, I would love to have some lectures at the end on let's say ethics or transparency or privacy or fairness of these models, but um, let's see, I, I would like to put it in there. So this is to be continued, right? We have something like 15 weeks. It could be, I haven't checked it. Okay, I think like it's 15 weeks. All right, and then course logistics, right? So we talked a little bit yesterday and I kind of appreciate the discussions we had. So it helped me a little bit to understand. So this is me. <laughs> uh, and for the exercises and a lot of stuff, this is me again. So um, uh, it's a, it's a one-man show this time. Hopefully next semester, I'll have some, some people here who will help me out. So uh, you can contact me on this email address, but we have some pretty good online resources. So we have this thing called Panda, which is a Moodle in the disguise. So, uh, I set up this uh, this course and I guess everybody's get automatically like signed up to this. So if I put an announcement there, you get an email. So that worked, this is good. Um, I'm, I don't know how much we should use this, this Panda thing for actually putting content or discussions because I found like, I find Moodle, yes. If you link your GitHub in there, because like- Oh yeah. I think uh, it's only in the email. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Well, it's it's on the announcement. I put it in the announcement. I I guess I put it yesterday in the announcement. Yeah. Uh, is it fine? Does it solve the problem? Oh, okay, cool. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah. So this is like the official kind of uh official platform for teaching. We might be using that, but I'm not really fancy of that because the user interface is really like 15 years back. Then we have uh, so I'm putting all the lectures on GitHub basically. And if you wanna, you know, uh, if you're gonna ask me whether these could be available maybe like two days in advance, my answer is no, they can't because I typically finish them like you know half an hour ago. So, but if you come here and just you know uh, get pull, you have you know we're 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 good. So, and and obviously as a GitHub, you know, I would it, my experience it really works when people spot mistakes, you know, make a pull request and or open an issue or stuff like that. So it's it's open source. So you'll free to contribute as well or typos or stuff like that. And I had a great experience with previous students to doing so. So feel free to do so. Uh, everybody's happy with GitHub? 
I mean, at the end of the day, you can just download the PDFs and that's good. So you don't have to like uh, fiddle around with Git. Um, okay, and I set up Discord as a something like, you know, 2023. So where we can basically discuss more stuff, more like, you know, it's like unofficial. So if you need something on Saturday, I'm not on Discord on weekends, not at all, or during the exam period. If you need something, like write me an email. I mean, uh, I'm old school guy, so I, I read emails. But if you want to chat about something or you have some some questions, you know, for, for to the audience, I guess Discord is the best channel, more or less. Everybody's happy with Discord. Any objections? Good. And I'm gonna put the, the lectures on YouTube, so the link will be. I think the link is on the on the GitHub actually. So just if you kind of uh, I don't know. If you, if you have to skip the, the lecture, you can just look it up. But come here, it's better. I don't like to talk to empty audience. I did it one year and it was horrible. Okay, any questions on the resources? Anything is missing there? I guess we're complete, right? Good. Textbooks and resources. Okay, so we don't have actually a textbook. Uh, and for each topic, I will kind of recommend uh, some background reading. Basically, it will be in the slides on the right-hand side. These are optional. And we are going to use freely available resources. So basically, research papers, if I'm, if I'm referring to a research paper, in most, it's mostly 90% like of the time, it's free. So you can download it. If it's not, um, I'll make it explicit. And these papers are coming mostly from the so-called ACL anthology. So ACL is the Association for Computational Linguistics. So this is the, the one of the largest kind of organizations doing conferences for NLP in the in the recent years. There's others like NeurIPS for machine learning and ICML for machine learning, machine learning and others. But mostly we are, you know, this this kind of field is home at, at ACL. And here's the link to ACL Anthology. And some papers are just published as a preprint on archive. So we'll be referring to papers from archive. OK, any questions? Good. We discussed the history. So OK, exercises, we'll, we'll do that. So we'll do some exercises like hands-on programming during the exercise sessions. Uh, you're basically split half-half to the two groups, which is fine. So we can have more like interaction one-to-one. -one. And the homeworks. There will be some homeworks. I guess, you know, submitting in groups of two makes quite a lot of sense, makes makes it easier maybe, or makes it manageable also for me for grading. And there most likely will be a bonus points for, you know, if you reach some threshold, which is not minimal, something like you really did something and you uh, you deserve a, a bonus. I would, I didn't, I wouldn't grade it for like, you know, uh, like multiple bonuses, I would just use one, you know, just if you finish the exam and you have the bonus, you know, the, the grade goes one up. Is it fine? Okay, cool. But I'll clarify that as we go. And the final exam, so I put two dates into the, so there was a questionnaire, you know, when we should, should the, uh, do the final exam. So I put two dates there because I guess you have two, uh, two trials. Is it, is it right? So, how, okay. <laughs> of the record, how do you do that? Like, do you go to the first one and you say, oh no, I give up and do to the next one or you sign up for the first one and go there? Or how, how is that? Like how, how people do that? It depends on the person. I usually go to the first one and hope I pass it so I don't have to write another one. Okay. And I like to finish all of the things in the first time. Okay. Some people don't sign up for the first one because they have so many there that they sign up for the second one. I see. Some people just try and then do the another one. Ah, okay. So yeah, that's true. That's 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 true. So it makes sense not to repeat the same exam in the second trial, right? Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, extra work. Okay, good. I'll do that. So, okay, there will be one. So the dates, the preferences were like... Uh, at the end of the of the semester, like uh, the the lectures, and then at the beginning of the next semester, something like that. I think it's typical, and I there was no uh, no collision with other courses from here at least. But you know, you never know. That's true. Okay, so the the exam will clarify that. But there's there's two dates, and there will be two different exams. Okay. <laughs> and as I said, you you know, as I said yesterday, so it's your course too. So any feedback, whatever it comes to your mind, talk to me live Discord forum, email. I also have a good experience with actually asking for anonymous feedback because people might, might be hesitant to say like, well, it's, you know, it sucks so much. So, you know, I hate it or whatever. If I put it anonymously, they kind of answer this, you know, honest questions. Although they don't say it's, I mean, there, there could be some feedback that you 
don't want to talk face to face. So I'm trying to put like uh, online feedback with Google Forms every three weeks or so, just you know, to get a get a sense what you think about it and uh, what you struggle with or not. And as I said, uh, the PR issues on GitHub. I guess we're through now with the logistics. Any questions? All right. So now a little bit about what we're doing in research, and I talked about it yesterday quite a bit. So I called my group Trustworthy Human Language Technologies. And what we mean by trustworthy is multiple things, and the one we are focusing on is privacy. So which means we call it privacy preserving natural language processing. And if you come to master's, uh, maybe after you finish bachelor's, I have a course in the summer se summer semester on um, on privacy preserving natural language processing when you learn about how to so for instance, if you if you give your data to, I don't know, well, if GPT steals your data or learns from your data, uh, GPT will remember more than you would like it to remember. So maybe even like your personal data, which you put in there. And just if you ask, oh, what is the personal data of, um, I don't know, uh, Tobias? Yeah, okay. So I get your address, Paderborn, you know, uh, Weinerstrasse, Traumswanzig and stuff like that. And you want to you know, protect that. Right? You don't want the models to remember your private data. So how can you do that? And it's much trickier than you might think. So this field about privacy preserving in LP, we're working with a formalism, which is called differential privacy, obviously deep learning and a little bit of graph networks and stuff like that. And the other part of our research is um, argument mining. So this is something like uh, what is an argument and how people argue. So there is a lot of argumentation online and things like that. So I, I did quite a research on that previously. But now we're actually looking in arguments that really matter in terms of uh, if you ar argue well, if you put good arguments, uh, you can win the case or you don't go to jail or whatever. You know. So we're looking at legal argumentation where basically parties argue in front of the court and make a legal argument, whatever it means. And it's very inter interdisciplinary work, quite interesting and um, quite challenging because of the language of legal NLP. So we're doing more in actually in legal NLP, not only argument mining. So these are two areas where kind of where we are with the, with the research group. So, and as I said yesterday, if you're interested in doing master thesis, well, actually maybe bachelor thesis, I don't know how you pick your topics. So get in touch. You know? If you need a heavy job, I'll be hiring some heavy. So you need to know something, obviously, in order to be be uh, uh, be helpful in the research project. But as you know, as I said, get in touch. Uh, I like to get to work with students very early on, and it's my email address. Any questions? All right. So now, this was the logistics, and let's come to the challenges of natural language processing. And. Why is natural language processing challenge? So we work with language, right? Natural language processing. Most of the examples here are actually in English and maybe in other languages, it's much more complicated or very different. But anyway, so one issue of human language, it's the high ambiguity. So things have multiple meanings in multiple different contexts and you never know what exactly it means. So example, if you compare I ate pizza with friends with I ate pizza with olives, <laughs> On the surface, it looks almost the same. We just replace uh, one noun here, but it has a very different meaning. I mean, it's, you know, from the syntax, you cannot, if you do the like syntax parsing in your head, you kind of understand it, what it means. Just on the surface, it's just a, the very same sentence and it has very different meanings. Actually, if you, if you're, uh, you know, oh no, you can, you can take the sentence, I ate pizza with friends in the same meaning as I ate pizza with all these as well, but you don't, want, you don't want to do that, no. Okay, so natural language is highly variable um, because you can say the same thing in man very many different ways. So for example, the core message of I ate pizza with friends, you can express it as a, yeah, friends I, and I shared some pizza or uh, yeah, and many other different ways you can say the same core message. And this is high variability. It's great for humans. So we can express so many things in language. It's maybe harder for machines to understand. So, but we are humans. You know, we are super great users of language because it serves a purpose. And we don't go into the philosophical details what why we use language. 
There's many different explanations for that. But anyway, we're using language for doing things. We are actually very poor at formally understanding and describing rules that govern language. So, you know, we as humans don't really, we are not linguists. Like you don't parse a sentence in a way, like if you, you know, if I ate pizza with friends and you understand immediately what it, mean, you know, what it means without understanding the syntax and the semantics and all, all the stuff. So the, the formal stuff is kind of hard for humans to understand, but we are very quick, you know, Anybody follows like, I don't know, cognitive psychology or Kahneman system one, two and, and things like that. No, it's a very interesting field. Like if you're interested in a kind of cognition and biases in there, just, just go for it anyway. But so this is language. Um, how can we solve that with machines? And some of you had already something, some, some experience with machine learning. So we have some uh, so an area of machine learning i think the most common is so-called supervised machine learning so supervised machine learning is means that if you have a, a task we come to the to the task later in this lecture you want to solve a problem and you describe the problem exactly what you're going to do is that you have a bunch of examples you show it to the machine and say okay i want to you know solve this like this you know follow these examples learn a pattern and then solve the task for me Okay, this is supervised machine learning. And it works for so many, uh, yeah, so many areas, including uh, uh, computer vision. So, okay, is, is this a cat on the picture or is it a, is it a dog? Like very typical one and other many areas. Um, so machine learning attempts to infer patterns and regularities from set of pre, excuse me, pre-annotated input-output pairs, which means input-output pairs basically, okay, here's the input and the output of the function is a dog like a category, go, or he's an, uh, an image and the output is a cat. And if I give the machine, so to say a thousand examples, it should learn how, you know, how to recognize dogs from, from cats. And the same may, might be working or is working for a nature language, but it's not that easy as we will see, right? But why is machine learning actually better than writing a set of rules? So if you wanna, I don't know, you wanna classify a sentence, whether it's a, it's a, let's say positive or negative. So if you write a hotel review saying like, oh, the, the hotel was, was awesome. You know, it had sauna in there and just, I enjoyed it. Or negative, like, oh, it's it stinks really in this hotel. So I don't want to go there. If you want to classify these, you might want just, you know, the, the easiest solution would be to write a program saying like, if word uh, great is in the text, then it's going to be positive. If or else, if word and so on, you can really write many complicated rules, but it doesn't scale. So if you have a new kind of unseen example, uh, because of the ambiguity of language, you're going to, you know, it won't work. So it's better to show examples and let the machine learn or trying to you know, like infer patterns from the training data. Everybody's with me? Makes sense. Okay, cool. But language is even more challenging. So... There are three properties that natural language has that are kind of very hard for supervised machine learning to deal with. And we're gonna tackle them right now. So language is symbolic and discrete. So we have language and basic elements of written language are our characters, right? So here, character B, A, S, I, C, and so on. Sure, yeah, we have characters. And the characters form words, and the words might denote objects or concepts, events, actions, idea, abstracts, things, so very many things. But these are discrete symbols. And what it means is that the words such as hamburger or pizza, they kind of evoke like a certain mental representation. Like think about it, like, uh, okay, <laughs> let's, let's give it a try. Pizza, oh, okay, hamburger, oh, okay, yeah. You kind of, you can imagine these things, even like if you think about it, right? So they, well, the mental representation is kind of uh, triggered by these words. But these are distinct symbols whose meaning is external to them. Like if you see this thing, it doesn't carry anything, it's just a bunch of letters. So it has to be interpreted in, uh, in our heads somehow. And there's no relation whatsoever between the word hamburger and pizza. Here, there's no relation whatsoever that can be inferred from the symbols or letters themselves, right? If you look at these bunch of letters here and this bunch of letters here, there's nothing like you can say about them. 
without thinking about the concepts behind them and kind of like, oh, these are foods and I kind of, uh, if I'm craving, I'm, I go for these foods and maybe they are not, um, not so healthy and, and things like that, right? But from these symbols alone, you're, yeah, you don't know unless you can interpret them. Which is very different from, for instance, color. So if you do some computer vision, the color or some acoustic signal, like you have the sine wave, oh, these are continuous concepts. So for example, you can take a colorful image, you know, like something with just uh, 16 million colors, and you can automatically convert it to great scale image. Just a simple, simple operation. You just convert, you know, the RGB into uh, a scale of uh, zero to two twenty two fifty five or something like that, and it works. And you get something which is, uh, you know, black and white, as compared to colorful image. So, and we can compare two colors. So if we have like a red and blue, based on some inherent properties, so something which they carry. So such as U or intensity or RGB. So they carry some meaning in themselves. And this cannot be done with words. So there's no simple operation to move from the word red to the word pink, right? I mean, these are color. If you see colors, you can do some mathematical operations and you can just compute a distance maybe or some U intensity values and you see they have more relevant than like a pink or and uh, blue, for instance. If you have the words red and you have the words pink, you have to somehow know it and look it up and maybe then using some word knowledge to see how oh, they are kind of not the same, but kind of close to each other. Does it make sense? Yeah, I mean, we hum and humans kind of, uh, yeah, but I can do that. <laughs> of course you can do that because you, you, in, you interpret everything like immediately, you know, red and pink. Oh yeah, sure, yeah, okay, close. Pizza, hamburger, ah, oh, okay, yeah. Uh, but just for, for a computer, these are just two symbols. And they had to deal with that. So this is one challenge. The other challenge is that language is compositional. So as we saw, we had letters and they form words and words can fra uh, form phrases and phrases go into sentences and sentences go to documents and documents go to the, I don't know what's in there, internet. <laughs> and I think that's it. Okay, so the meaning of a phrase Actually, the meaning of a phrase can be larger than just the meaning of the individual words. And if you combine words, you get a phrase and the meaning is just more than, I don't know, like a sum of the words. And how it works is mostly very complicated, like these rules, how you compose things. So for example, one phenomena is called multi-word expressions. So for instance, New York, so yeah, sure, New York City. Uh, but if you just take this word and this word together, I mean, New York, okay, you would say it's maybe it's a, yeah, it's a town and new, like if you combine new and New York, you don't get New York. It's just two different concepts, like two different meanings completely. Or a phrase, phrasal verbs, like look something up, you'd like to search something. Yeah, but it's not like look something up. So if you take it verbally, like look up something, Right, so you, you cannot combine these things. It's a phrasal verb, a phrasal uh, a, a phrase, or even idioms, which actually like literally makes no sense. Kick the bucket. You know, everybody knows what's kick the bucket. Is somebody doesn't know what's kick the bucket? It's to die. Or blue chip. You know what a blue chip is? I think it's a. Um, so actually, I'm I'm not a native speaker, but I guess blue chip is. Um, are companies uh, like tech companies or stocks of tech companies or something like that? Yeah, it's it's an idiom. Like everybody maybe if you were a native speaker, you would know, yeah, blue chip, sure. Uh, I need to do this example. It's kind of embarrassing. I don't know what it means, but you can look it up. Okay, so can somebody just in the you know in the break look up what is what is a blue chip? So to interpret a text, we need to work beyond the level of letters and words, right? Because if you just work with letters and words, you get a kid get a bucket. So you see like somebody kicking the bucket, but it's just a completely different meaning. It's like, it won't work. You cannot work with text like that. So look into long sequences of words, such as, uh, you know, long set sequences of words, such as sentences, or even the, the entire document. So you have large, we call it like large, um, Large dependencies or long, long, um, uh, long-range dependencies, where you need 
maybe the full document to understand the word, like understand a concept. At the end of the document, you need to know the whole context. So anybody found what a blue chip is? What is it? Uh, a very successful company. A very successful company. Okay, yeah. Okay. Interesting. Stuck? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I didn't read too late. <laughs> So it's a capital stock. Uh, it's a, it's a stocks of very successful companies. So if you if you if you own shares of uh, Nvidia nowadays, then you're you have blue chips maybe. Okay. So composition compositionally in language, it's it's a tricky thing, right? So we are we agree on that. Yeah. And then when we come when we come to using supervised machine learning and all these examples, you want these examples, but the combination of words <laughs> to four meanings is is huge well how huge are in this is you know kind of uh not really infinity but just think about it okay so let's just think something very simple let's say we have vocabulary okay how how big is the vocabulary of let's say english so if you take a vocabulary of english like a dictionary how many words are in there roughly any idea how many words in english are there in dictionary any 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 suggestions? Is it like a thousand? No, I mean yeah. So fifty thousand to hundred thousand, good. Any other suggestions? I guess it's even more. I guess like it could be from two hundred thousand to five hundred thousand actual words where you can put in dictionary. You can look it up. So I don't know. I'm I'm just guessing now, but it's like in hundreds of thousands. Okay, how many words are in um? How many words can exist in German? Is it less? Is it more? Yes, there's more because you can make more compound words and you put strange things together. And yeah. Then there are new words, so. Yeah. So exactly because in German you have you can you have compound. I'll get you. You have compounds. You have some other phenomena that in English is not not so present, which is called morphology. So you're inclining words into like uh you know the first, fourth, second, final, four. For different things, if you have morphologically rich language, for example, as a Slavic language, you have seven cases times two. So you have, you know, for one one noun, you have fourteen versions, maybe. Yeah, I mean, it feels feels natural. Sure, yeah, of course. And if you go to, I don't know, like Finnish, uh, it's even more complicated, and the compounds make it. So you have a lot of words. Could be like you typically work work with hundreds of thousands as well. So you you say like my vocabulary is like five hundred thousand words. Okay, so you were saying. Yeah, there would be too many. These are words. Have you ever got a got a letter from a um, let's go? Okay, finance amt. They're using words. They're that long. They are not in Duden, of course. I mean, <laughs> but they are words, and yeah. and they're using language. So you know, that's true. And they have meaning, right? I mean, they're of course. I mean, these compositions. You can kind of understand their meaning from the from the composition, from the actual words. So I'm always asking, like, yeah, but you can you could have written like just use five words, not just one. And like, I don't know why they bring that. Anyway, it's just embarrassing people. It's really and it's different actually from a from a state to state. So I got a I got a letter now from from uh, NRV, and they actually simplify the language. I can see references from Hessen to to NRV. In Hessen, if you get like a, a letter from Finance and like, wow. So, well, anyway. Um, so that's why this is like almost infinite. It's huge. Okay, so then this, this was just one word. Okay, so if you're, if you're going to combine, if you want to make a sentence of five words, how many, and we have 100, okay, let's say we have just 100K, 100K words. So the size of the vocabulary is 100K. So how, and we have a sentence length, it's five. So how many options how many options we're gonna end up with? I know it's Friday morning, sorry about it, but it's a, it's a simple mathematical operation. Any idea? Is it going to be five times hundred thousand? Uh, Is it going to be something even worse? Exactly. It's a lot. <laughs> it's a it's a lot of it's and it's just hundred thousand words and just five words. 
So if you have a document of length 500 words and an actual vocabulary of half a million or a million words, then this is fair to say, right? So this, that's, that's, you know, we have so many options to th say things in, in language. Everybody agree with me? Which means we could never, ever, never, ever enumerate all possible valid sentences, for instance. You cannot really generate all possible sentences in German. This is just so huge. You can't do that in a, in a lifetime. And the point is that there's also like, we talk about this color, uh, red and pink, and also for sentences, there is no clear way of generalizing from one sentence to another or defining the similarity between sentences that does not depend on their meaning, which is, as we saw before, unobserved to us, right? So if we have two sentences, you cannot on the surface say they are similar because this is the same with the words, we have to interpret them and kind of understand, yeah, I ate pizza with friends or uh, me, ate, me, uh, me and my friends ate pizza together. You have to interpret the events and the friends and everything. And you say, oh, this is the same thing actually, right? Which makes it challenging when we want to learn from examples, because if even if we have like huge, huge, huge example set, we are well likely to observe events that never occurred in the example set and that are very different from them. So I can show you like 100,000 examples of the sentence uh, of, of a good review of a hotel, hotel but um, I can guarantee you if I show you some, some new data, like uh, you know tomorrow, there will be a, a sentence which you've never seen before, which is completely new on the surface level. Not in the meaning, it will be the same as the previous one, but on the surface level. So it makes it very difficult to work with these things, okay? Any questions? All right. So you can look up then uh, how, how large is the vocabulary in English. I would be just very curious. Yeah? Ask Wikipedia. Ask Wikipedia. It has around 171,000 words, mm -hmm. but they are online dictionaries that have over 500,000. Yes. And yeah. Okay. So we are in the, in the ballpark of 100 to 500,000. Okay, cool. So now we know how complicated language is, and now we're gonna have to uh, have a look into what can we, what are we actually trying to do with language? Well, why are we actually interested in natural language processing in the first place? Like we, well, language is hard, so why should we do that? So the why question is, I don't know. It's just challenging, and you kind of feel urged to do something with language. So you know, people in the '60s says like, yeah, okay, language is easy. We'll we're gonna solve it in five years. Okay, so it's 2023, and we didn't solve language. Uh, although we had all these beautiful tools such as uh, GPT and, and stuff like that, we didn't solve language. It's super hard still for some reasons. So we're going to go through a, um, I would say not a list of typical tasks, but something where, you know, because if you want to work with language, maybe you're, so, you're, you're solving a goal or some, some sort of uh, objective or a task. So I'm going to highlight the typical ones, which people mostly in the research have been dealing with and, and um, showing maybe some progress in the, in the area. So why exactly? Because when we use deep learning, we need to know it's a tool. So deep learning is just a tool, right? And why we need this tool? And how do we know that we have the right tool? So in these two come, uh, these two questions come hand in hand. So let's split um, the task into like very coarse grain it into two parts. One is would be like text classification and the other would be text generation roughly. Okay. So it's not like, it's not set in stone. It's just an you know, operationalization, op operationalization of the, of, of the problem. So we'll start with text, text classification tasks. And, um, one of the most famous or most widely used uh, text classification task, and when I say task, it also means a data set, which are typically used, is a binary classification of, of reviews from IMDb. Uh, so it's movie reviews, right? IMDb is the international movie database. Everybody knows IMDb? Okay, cool. So, and the task, as had, so the task has been formed. I mean, it didn't exist. Somebody just came and said like, I want to classify whether a movie review is either negative 
or positive. All right, this is the task. And then you might be asking right now, okay, uh, is it that simple? I mean, could it, maybe it's like not, I, I don't know. Is it really only positive or negative? It could be something in, in between, right? Yeah, so <laughs> exactly. So just bear in mind, somebody make up this task for a research saying like, I want to explore something. I'm going to create a task from this data set and I'm going to make an arbitrary decision. It's going to be binary. And I'm, simplif I'm making a lot of assumptions and I'm simplifying things quite a lot, right? So this task didn't exist before. It is like, I'm going to say a review of a movie is either positive or either negative. It might be a little bit different from, okay, it's a cat or it's a dog where you can objectively say, yeah, I mean, typically they look differently, right? I mean, cats and dogs. But anyway, so they decided, okay, there will be no like a middle ground. You know, it could be a review which is like both negative and positive in some parts. It could be a review which is neutral. No, we're ignoring that and we're saying it's positive and negative. So that was their decision of, of these people in, um, in 2011. So this is the paper where they introduced this data set. And it's a very famous, well, okay, so there is an example from this data set, and uh, this is actual, I think this is the shortest review from IMDb from this data set. It's just these six words. Read a book, forget a movie. Yeah, uh, it's saying the movie is bad, right? But there's nothing, so if you think about it, like there's nothing saying uh, this is a bad movie. No, it's saying like, yeah, read a book, forget a movie. So you have to kind of interpret what it means that you should do something else instead of watching a movie, which means the movie is maybe crap. No? So this is what makes it tricky to understand language, okay? And it's called, it, it's labeled negative. How they created the data set, I guess they took the, so there is on IMDb, there's like star reviews, like one to 10 stars, I guess. And I believe they said everything with eight stars plus will be positive and everything with two stars and less will be negative, something like that. So they basically scrape it from the internet. You know, there was no human saying this movie, this Reviews positive or negative. So we just get cheap data from the internet. Okay. Um, and they tested semantic compositionality and long range dependencies because in these movies, you know, movie reviews are kind of very, very nice language, actually. So very, I would say, poetic, maybe in some ways. So you don't really, I mean, if you write a hotel review, you say, like, oh, it's, it was really terrible. If you write a movie review, you want to show up like, oh, I'm actually clever. I understood the movie. So, you know, blah, 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 blah. So it's a nice language, by the way, in there. Um, why is it so popular? Okay, so it's very simple. It's binary. The task is not actually easy. So if you would kind of, if you have to program it from scratch, like uh, using rules, you would end up with 50% accuracy or something like that. So it's not a trivial task to solve. And um, it's balanced. So there, there's 25,000 training data, 25,000 test data points, and it's balanced, which means there is uh, 15 half K positive and K negative, which is good for machine learning. So, and why is it interesting? As it's like poetic movie. Uh, wh what is this MNIST? Anybody heard of MNIST before? The MNIST data set, okay? It's a collection of 10,000 or so, uh, handwritten numbers mm -hmm. that was used in the 90s to care for specify uh, machine learning on find uh, guess, guess correct, uh, mem Yeah, OK, yes. Like a uh, image classification. Exactly. So this like, exactly. Thank you. So from 90s, it's a collection of, of uh, 100 letters, 0 to, zero to 9, each with the category 0 to 9. and. Uh, it's been used in machine learning forever because this is like, like the, the litmus paper test. Like if your model doesn't work on MNIST, it can't work on anything else. It's like the, 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 mo you know, the most standard data set. You have to try your machine learning model if you do anything with computer vision. So for natural language processing, I believe this IMDB data set is one of those uh, data sets as well. So if you do anything, if you propose a new GPT-7, you should you should try it on IMDb to show like okay it's um uh, it's not worse than the previous models if it's worse then maybe something is wrong with your data set or with your model okay so any questions to IMDb data set okay 
So where do you get it? Where to get the data set? So typically nowadays you go to huggingface.co slash datasets and you will find, I think it's like half a year ago, 29,000 data sets, including the IMDB data set. So you would download the data set and you have everything prepared. So the training data, test data, the labels and everything, you can just plug it into your you know, experiments and it works out of box. If you were to create a new data set, then you have a lot of freedom to do so, okay? But to, to take an existing data set such as the IMDB data set, you, you get it. But you, know, you should properly cite it, like maybe even the link and the paper, because there could be so many variants of different data sets. So it's real better to be you know, very clear what you're doing for reproducibility. So we're coming to another task, which is called natural language inference. And here it goes. So you're given two sentences. For example, the text, a soccer game with multiple males playing. So it's a describing some picture maybe. And there's a hypothesis. Some men are playing sports. And the goal is if you see the text and then read the hypothesis, is is this true? Is the hypothesis true? So if I say a soccer game with multiple males playing, and then some men are playing sport, yeah, that's true, given the given the text, right? I mean, there's some soccer game is a sport maybe, and men are playing sports. Yeah, that's uh, males and so on. So you, you say, okay, yeah, this is an entitlement. This is true. So given the text, is the hypothesis true? And here we have not, it's not binary task. It's a, it's a three class problem. So we either have the entitlement or contradiction. So what would be a contradiction here? If I had a text, a soccer game with multiple males playing, and the hypothesis would be some women are playing sport, it would be a contradiction, right? Because we have here the males playing. So if I said uh, some women are playing sport, it would be wrong. It's not true. OK, everybody's with me? OK. So, and then if, if they have nothing to do together, so a soccer game with multiple males playing, and I would say, uh, I ate banana this morning. I didn't, but well, if I ate banana this morning, it would be like neutral, okay? And this is also a interesting data set um, because it was collected manually, actually. So the IMDB data set, as we had before, it was annotated for free. So what does it mean? We got the labels from the actual authors because we scraped, I mean, they scraped the, the internet and to the stars, <laughs> which were given by the authors. So it's for free. While here, it was Brit written actually by, by people. So they collected half a million of these sentence pairs and manually labeled each of them with, with three classes. So it's a lot, right? I mean, if you, if, if, um, if you have to manually label half a million of these examples, it's a lot of work. So how, how can you do that? Well, you hire students, poor students, or you pay people to do so. Like a, there's a platform called Amazon Mechanical Turk where you can basically scale up and give like small tasks for small fee and overall you can really uh, collect a lot of data, but it's not cheap anyway. Okay, so this is a this is an interesting task because it it's testing some other understanding of language because it has to understand this kind of um, inferences between these two texts. If you know if you have to build this, the, the system would have to understand maybe some generalizations, maybe some lexical alignments, lexical generalization, or some relations between words and phrases and stuff like that. So it's it's not trivial. Okay. Any question? Okay. It's a sidestep. I was talking about it, right? So. Many data sets are annotated by experts and it's super costly. So we have one example with the, uh, um, with the legal scholars. We annotated uh, arguments in court decisions and you need lawyers to do so because you know, if you were, if I ask you like, read me, read me a court decision, you were like, oh, I don't understand the word. I don't understand the word, maybe you would. So we had to hire, uh, we had to hire students from the law. We had, I guess, six of them and they worked for a year for annotating kind of documents in a, in the legal jargon, right? It's a lot of work, so expert and super costly. And typically what you do is that each example is uh, annotated by multiple annotators because maybe there's some subjectivity or errors and then you decide on the final GOAT label maybe by taking the majority or maybe dis discussing among each other. So, right, so because some things might be, might be subjective, for example, 
if you're, you know, the movie reviews might be kind of depending which, you know, how you interpret the text. So maybe you want more people annotating the same point kind of to, to agree on the gold label. And this is really a sidestep, but uh, you can compute how well these agree. So there's this uh, inter-annotator agreement and it gives you a score of kind of reliability of these annotators, okay? So some, if you ever see like, if somebody's asking, okay, so there's data said, what was the agreement? Like, oh, I never heard of agreement. No, you heard of agreement, okay? So you need to, this is something like a, saying about the quality of the annotation process, okay? Any questions? You don't have to, you don't have to read this paper, but just that you heard that, okay? And second side step, so who actually creates these data? I mean, why people create these uh, IMDB data set and SNLI and stuff like that? So it's basically a, a, a playground for people to, you know, uh, to which extent MLP, NLP can solve these problems. It's the same with the handwritten the digit, recogn the digit recognition from the 90s. People are still like, yeah, we are working on computer vision, so can we have a data set that everybody would be able to test models on, and we can share the same data set. So if we evaluate, then if we say like, we have 90% 90, 90 accuracy, we're, we can compare really apples to apples. So everybody has this shared data set, okay? And these shared data set are popular with machine learning and NLP. Um, and they build some taxonomies, yeah. So, and the names are actually made up, but sentiment analysis is quite a standard thing. So it belongs to text classification, and SNLI is sort of like sentence per classification tasks. So there's sort of a taxonomy of, of task, but it's also not set in stone, okay? So. so we are now on the sentence level. Now let's go deeper into the sentence. And uh, another very popular task, it's so-called name entity recognition. Which basically says, if you have a piece of text such as here, the UN official ECUS heads for Baghdad. So it's obviously something from the news from 20 years back, maybe. You want to identify some entities from a list of predefined entities. So you want to say, okay, this first word is an organization, and this is maybe a person, and this is definitely a location. So it's a city. Why this could be interesting? Why would you need to entity? Why would you need a tool to find entities in a text? Any idea? What what is what is it good for? Any use cases in commercial setting of websites uh, would need to extract information in a structured way. Okay. okay in, yeah, information extraction would be like like where are the entities, or maybe for I would say like maybe for ser uh, search or kind of. Um, I would say like a, if a politician, you know, reads the news, I think they have agencies who scrape the, the news and searching for their names in the news kind of to get them, uh, you know, what's, you know, if I were Donald Trump and I would read like every day. No, he doesn't read news, I guess. I don't know. He's watching uh, some, uh, I don't know, some television, whatever. Um, so you can extract these things or maybe you want to replace them as well. So if you want to anonymize things, you might just, you know, replace names with... Uh, with something else. Okay, so this is a task. It makes a lot of sense. So how to model these, how to model and annotate such a task? Um, we call it a sequence labeling task. So when we talk about sequence labeling, we have a sequence here of words or tokens also. Token is like the minimal unit of word here. We'll talk about it later about tokens as well. So we split the sentence into each, you know, a token and the dot here is also like a single token and we assign a word, uh, a type. And here in this, uh, so this is coming from this, um, from this competition 20 years back, co-NLL co is a standard data set. So if you say co-NLL 2003, everybody knows this is this is data set and uh, name the recognition. And you basically assign a label to each token in the sentence. So you would say, okay, this is going to be this label, I org, this is going to be the O. So each sequence, each word in the sequence, each token in the sequence, sequence get a, gets a, a label. So why are these, I mean, org makes sense, like organization, per is like person, and LOC is like location. Why are these I here? So what does it mean? It means, that you have to distinguish whether you are in a sentence, uh, sorry, in, in a sequence or 
um, or at the beginning of a sequence when two sequences of the same uh, same type are after each other. I guess I have an example on the next slide. Yes. So what if two consequent tokens are of the same type? For example, what could be that? Uh, tu -tu 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 -tu. Well, I don't have an example actually now, but it, it can happen. So you have like a token one, token two, and token three, and token four. And like imagine this is this is person, a person, and this is also a person, another one. So you need to distinguish these two because then you have to, you know, you have to kind of understand here's here's another entity beginning. So that's why you use the the B tagging here. So you would say this is I person, and now I have to distinguish that. So I'm saying this is the B person. And this is maybe something else. So always like other. Does it make sense? So you have to distinguish it. It's called BIO encoding. It's kind of confusing because people also using something else and they're saying if the sequence is starting, I'm starting, I'm always starting with the B and then I put E if the entity is longer. So for example, uh, token Olaf short token. You might also annotate it as O, then beginning of a person, then you continue the entity. So you would say it's inside of the entity, and then you go O. This makes actually more sense to me and to many other people, but in the original CoNL it was differently. You, in the original CoNL, you would say this is O, this is I person, and this is I person, and this is O. You know, so pay attention. What I'm trying to say here, no matter what you choose, which kind of encoding scheme, you have to be very clear what you're doing and understand you know, what you're labeling. Because then if you just, yes. Yeah, I would say it would be another I. So it uh, would be, give me a name, three, three words. Give me a name with three words. Famous person. I don't know. Any other? Yeah, it's it's two words. Who is famous and have three words? I have a friend. He's called Van der Pols. It's his surname. So I would I would label it B person, I person, I person. Right. This is like one entity. So basically, it's kind of unique, unambiguous way of saying this is one entity, and it has a beginning and and something after that. And is it clear? Any any questions? BIO encoding. Okay. So name entity recognition is a task, and this is the standard data set CoNLL 2003. Okay. Good. Um, <laughs> then we are coming to something which is. Uh, it's a very funny name, super glue. It's actually a collection of other tasks, so a various task data set in English. So you would have a combination of different subtasks in this super collection, the super glue, and it gives a metric, and it kind of it should, its 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 purpose is to say like how your model is doing language understanding over various different tasks. So let's look into what is in superglue. So in superglue is um, textual entitlement. Oh, we've seen it before. OK, ah, interesting. So what we saw like SNLI data set, uh, which was like three-way classification. So actually, recognizing textual entitlement was before SNLI. And it's two class binary classification. So this time we don't have any any neutral. We just have entitlement or not. But the setup is the same. So we have text. Dana Reed, the widow of the actor Christopher Reeve, has died of lung cancer at age 44, according to the Christopher Reeve Foundation. So this is text. And now 
you have to say whether the hypothesis is now true or false. Christopher Reed had an accident. No, you cannot infer this sentence from the from the text. So no, it's not entitlement. It's false. Okay. So we're simplifying the the three way entitlement uh, contradiction and neutral into just entitlement yes or no. Okay. So this is this was pre uh, SNLI, but it's part of the super glue. So if you why I'm saying this, you know, if you read the paper or in the, maybe you're in the news like oh chat GPT is better than humans. So how how can you tell? Well, it it it's better on these tasks with you know better metrics on task A or B. It's like okay, interesting. So what is task A or B? Uh, oh, we tested it on superglue. Yeah, okay. So what does it mean? Oh, a superglue is basically RTE and many other. Ah, okay, now we can talk. So RTE. So it can understand entitlement better than maybe other models. This is why we're talking about this, right? Superglue is kind of should be so the models should be tested on the superglue if they claim they understand language. So then there is another task, which is, um, so, you know, as you see, like it takes a larger context a little bit. So we have something larger than one sentence. So we have a sentence with a pronoun and a list of noun phrases from the sentence. And we have to find the correct referent to the pronoun. So for example, Mark told Pete many lies about himself, which Pete included in his book. He should have been more truthful. Uh, so and now the question is whether he is Pete or maybe some other person or Mark. So here, the he is Mark because Mark should have been more truthful. He shouldn't lie. So Pete wouldn't, you know, it's kind of, oh, you have to think about it a little bit. Like, what is it, you know, uh, what's the true answer? So you need to interpret the story and understand it and then say, oh, okay, yeah. So he is definitely not Pete here in this example, and it's not a co-reference, okay? So it needs, what do you need to solve this task as a human? You need a common sense reasoning and everyday knowledge. You need to understand what lying is about when two people lie to each other, if you take somebody's lies and make a book out of it, if it's good or not, and things like that. It's pretty complicated, right? I mean, as a human, you have to, you have to understand the, the world. So it's a brilliant task for machines to try, you know, to, to showcase whether they can understand all these things, everyday knowledge, common sense reasoning, resolution, and things like that. So it's called Vinograd Schema Challenge, and it's a really a challenge task, co-reference resolution, one of those. Any questions? Okay. Um, and the difficulty goes on. So the bull queue is a, um, what is it? Affected information, difficult, entitlement-like inference. Okay, so entitlement-like inference. Uh, here's an example. I think it's a question and some sort of uh, passage and you have to say whether you have to answer it like an answer okay and a question about the passage okay passage 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 I guess okay the question is has the UK, be, UK been hit by a hurricane and, and the passage goes like the snippet goes like the great storm of 1987 was a violent extra, uh, extra tropical cyclone which caused causalities in England France and the Channel Islands and blah 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 it goes on and on and you have to answer whether the UK have, has been hit by a hurricane from this text. And the answer is yes. Uh, yeah, how do you know? I mean, you have to somehow understand that this hurricane is a violent extra tropical cyclone. Yeah, so some sort of entitlement, but maybe there's, and then, well, UK, okay, yeah, England, you have to somehow make all these links. So, it requires the same like entitlement. So you need to like, is there any relation between maybe uh, like lexical entitlement or semantic entitlement? But it's more tricky because the, pas the, the passage is kind of long and there could be like a misleading information there. So it's kind of tricky, tricky uh, task, right? I agree, is it tricky? Might be, depending on the, the actual examples, but I, I guess for machines, yeah. 
they may be tricky. And it's part of super glue as well. So glue Q. And then it's uh, something even more complicated, and it's called multi-sentence re reading comprehension. So there, each example is a um, it's again a context paragraph, so a bunch of text, then a question about the paragraph, and then the list of possible answers, whether it's false or true. So it's kind of similar as a blue queue, but maybe a little bit, you know, a little bit different, because there are multiple possible correct answers. So it means like each answer has to be evaluated differently from, from all other, sorry, each question has to be evaluated differently from all other questions. And then answering each question requires drawing facts from multiple context sentences. So you have to really take the whole paragraph and understand it. Do I have an example here? No, I don't. But it's something similar as a blue cube. So you have to comprehend the whole paragraph and in order to uh, you know, answer the question as a, as, a, as a machine. So these are actually not, not trivial tasks, right? It's very different from like sentiment analysis of, of, of movie reviews. This is really tricky. A, you have to understand a lot of common sense knowledge to solve it, right? Do you agree? Okay. And another very popular task, I don't know if it's in Supergroup, by the way, but it might be. It's so-called squat. So, so, what's the abbreviation? Stanford question understanding, question answering data set. Stanford question answering data set 2.0, okay. And here um, is, is the example. So, integer species. Uh, so, this is a, a paragraph, I guess, from Wikipedia. And it's, it's very long. So, other legislation followed, including the blah, 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 Conservatory Act of 1929. A 1937 treaty prohibiting the hunting off right and great whales and the bald eagle protection egg. It's raw. Oh, okay. These later laws had a low cost to society. The species were very rare and little opposition was raised. Okay. So this is a uh, bunch, um, bunch of sentences for Wikipedia, a paragraph or two. And then the question is like, which laws face significant opposition? So you're asking question about a text. And the plausible answer is like, oh, okay, later later laws. Okay, interesting. What was the name of the 1937 treaty? And the plausible answer is Bald Eagle Protection Act. And there's also like questions which you which are unanswerable given the text. You cannot answer that. Unanswerable question with plausible incorrect answers, yes. And the relevant keywords here are in uh, in bold. But this is kind of tricky. I mean, this is sort of a, I would say like reading understanding task, which if you learn a foreign language and make a test, I think these tasks will be definitely there. Like reading comprehension, you, you're given exactly this part of that, of text and you need to understand it and answer questions. And there could be tricky questions. So this is the very same kind of concept, right? I mean, every, anybody, everybody had that, like uh, one of those tests before? I guess so. There could, could be tricky questions. So it's really non-trivial actually for machines to understand. So squat. Okay, so we are talking about a classification task where you basically classify to a predefined set of categories. But also, as we are in the in the era of GPT, which is generating text. So there are also text generation tasks. And the most prominent so far is machine translation. So anybody thinks like okay, anybody thinks machine translation is solved? Like who's using machine translation like on a daily basis? Cool. Okay. Do you think it's solved? It's perfect. No, it's not. It's hard. It's hard even in like languages where you didn't expect it. So I took this picture earlier this year in uh, on Tenerife, and somebody used Google Translate and translated uh, news of the month on the menu as Nachrichten des Monats. I don't think it's correct to be honest on the menu. Makes no sense. Uh, of, oh, yeah, it's a news of the month. Of, of course, because news could also be like a news uh, in the media. Yeah, okay, then it's correct. If you were, if you were uh, uh, you know, if you were running a, a website with news, then maybe it's fine, but not a menu in a restaurant. So, you know, machine translation is still far from being solved, even for a task which seems to be like super easy. Obviously, this person didn't speak any, didn't speak any German, so they just put it on the menu and call it a day. But the food was great, actually. But anyway, so machine translation, machine translation is hard. And there are a couple of standard data sets to evaluate your machine translation and, and to train and evaluate your machine translation. 
and they are called WMT, which is an abbreviation of a workshop on machine translation. So, um, the problem with machine translation is that you can have obviously multiple translation of the same thing. So if you want one sentence in one language, you can translate to another language to carry the same meaning, but it could be different. So you might want to use human evaluators, but they also disagree for each translation if it's correct or wrong. So there is a lot of, lot of, lot of subjectivity coming in. Okay. So here the case is that 10 translators translate the same short sent a French sentence. Uh, who speaks French here? I don't. Anybody speaks French? I mean, can you read a sentence without, you know, no? I can't. Sans le démontier, il est mon... Okay, it's ridiculous. I can't, I can't read it. Okay, so there is a French sentence and they ask people to... ask people to translate it to, to English. So, and here you get like 10 different translations. Without fail, he has been concise and accurate. Without getting frustrated, flust, sorry, flustered, he showed himself to be concise and precise. And so, so you end up with this tiny little sentence, you can end up with 10 different translations. And then you don't know what's this correct or, or not. So you ask human evaluators who speak both French and English, which is good or not. So is it correct or wrong? And they disagree as well. So it's very subjective. Translation is very tricky even like to, to not to do, but even to evaluate like what is, what is wrong, what is good. And I guess this is your experience as well. If you translate from, I don't know, like what you, so what you're translating from to like, uh, if you're using machine translation, what are you translating for? What is the source and target languages? English. German and English, okay. So who does German and English? Okay, yeah, that's okay. How many times do you see, like, after you see the old code, you would say, like, oh, maybe I'll change this word. Yes. Yes. Right. Because it's, uh, yeah, maybe it's wrong. Maybe it's, uh, it will sound differently if you, oh, okay. And human, so it's, there, there's a lot of, there's a lot of subjectivity in there. And people do it for stylistic reasons, for correctness reasons, for many different reasons. Okay. Um, so machine translation is hard. Machine translation and evaluating machine translation is even harder. So keep that in mind. But it's a very cool task. And it has a lot of implication because everybody's using machine translation nowadays, including me. Um, another task is a document summarization or abstractive document summarization, which means you are given a, a news article. So article from the news, which are pretty long. So 800 tokens on average. It's quite a, could be like one page or even longer. And they're paired with multi-sentence summaries. So basically somebody to the effort as a human and summarize what is content of this article per hand. Like, I don't know, uh, there was a hurricane last year in Paderborn and it took down four houses and it was, that's what I heard the news yesterday actually. I mean, was it, it was bad, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So somebody summarized this in four sentences, and obviously because there's a lot of subjectivity, what you keep up, pick up from the document, they took multiple one, multiple ones, or they, there could be one gold standard, multiple. I don't know exactly, but anyway. So that's a lot of lot of data, and the, this is a standard one of the standard summarization ta uh, tasks. So you might be wondering. So the question you might be asking now is if you have this task. And it's you create a summary and you have one gold standard summary. How do you evaluate it? How do you know your your system is working? How do you compare these two sentences, right? No, I mean, if you have a if you have something which is true, but it's a text, and you have your system which generates another text, like a summary of this hurricane event in Paderborn. It's using maybe different words. It's using maybe different kind of things from that. So how do you how do you know it's correct and good? Yeah, how can you compare two texts? That's a, that's a good that's a question I'm asking. Like I, I don't I want you like to come to this to ask the question yourself. Like well, if I'm if I'm going like document summarization or machine translation, 
if I really translate this, how 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 do I know? And this is maybe the gold standard data. If this were the correct answer in my data set, and this would be like the sort answer, and I generate something a little bit different from that, how do I evaluate it? How do I know it's good or not? Right? We'll come to that. The same for summarization. How do I know my summary is good? So there are different techniques. Okay. And we're leaving um, uh, text generation with something which is maybe useful for for dialogues like Alexa type of dialogues, and it's a persona chat, so it's a dialogue, it's a chit chat, and it goes like that. So there is a hundred sixty thousand data uh, data points, and the task is to predict or to generate next utterance, next sentence. So you are given information about two persons. So person one is they, they wrote something about themselves. So I like to ski. My wife doesn't like me anymore. <laughs> this is very sad. My wife doesn't like me anymore. I went to Mexico four times this year. I hate Mexican food. I like to eat Cheetos. I think this guy has an, uh, has serious issues in his life. Well, okay. Person or two. I'm an artist. I have four children. I recently got a cat. I enjoy walking for exercise. I love watching Game of Thrones. Okay, so you clearly see, I mean, these are made up. So I guess... When they created a data set, they asked a couple of maybe students, like, make up a person, you know, write five sentences, who you are, and then you can have a dialogue. Because why they did that, they want to kind of have a little bit of kind of grounding if you talk about something that it's kind of related to who you are. You know, you don't completely talk rubbish. So maybe this person, one, if you don't look down, down here, but maybe like from, from these two persons, these two descriptions, my maybe person two will be talking a little bit about art and cats, and maybe this guy will. They need he needs therapy. I'm I'm pretty sure. Okay, anyway, and then there is this um, dialogue. These two people actually wrote, so they they really had this dialogue. Hi, hello, how are you today? Uh, bless you, and uh, I'm God. Thank you. How are you? Oh, great, thanks. My children and I were just about to watch a Game of Thrones. Oh, okay, nice. How old are your children? I have four. The range and age of blah blah blah. I don't have any children at the moment. It just that means you get to keep all the popcorn for yourself. Oh, and Cheetos at the moment. Oh, good choice. Do you watch Game of Thrones? No, I do have to. <clears throat> okay, so it's a chit chat. It's completely nonsense, but maybe some people would like to talk to Alexa like that. Maybe somewhere. Anyway, so they created a data set. <laughs> Quite a lot of these discussions, like, uh, you know, back and forth. And the task would be then, maybe if I just remove this this last one, if you're given this context, your model should pre protect, uh, your model should um, generate the last sentence or something along these lines, basically predicting what the person is going to say. Why is it good? If you, if you build Alexa and you talk to Alexa in a way, the Alexa should kind of react to what you say and trying to make a dialogue. So this is like generating a next sentence in a dialogue given what has been told before. You look puzzled. So what, what is, is it clear or not? should like uh, think about uh, the, the uh, how the persons are in, in the character like uh, the, the upper part mm -hmm. the, uh, yeah like predicting the persona from the text yeah. okay yeah that, that could be also possible I guess maybe somebody even did that from the text but uh, that was not the task the task was like to generate the dialogue yeah but it's you can also do that I guess if you take the data set and want to predict who the persons are to generate the persona why not? Could be possible. But this task is about like the next utterance generation. Because you want to train your Alexa. That's that's the point. Like you really want to train your uh, assistants or whatever for generating some meaningful discourse. You know, chit chat. There's this Alexa prize where everybody uh, have you heard about the Alexa prize? Anyone heard of that? Okay. So I guess it's donated, uh, it's um it's sponsored by Amazon, obviously. It could be like a million dollars, something like that. Or ten thousand dollars, something. So there is some, uh, there is a competition, and I guess the objective is to have the longest conversation with Alexa. So who achieves like a chit chat Alexa for the longest time, and it's kind of then evaluated by other humans saying like, yeah, it would made sense, it was good, and stuff like that. So who is the best one in that wins the prize. 
Yeah. So that's why you need these data sets for you know training these models and, and evaluating. Okay. So we covered classification and we covered generation. And now actually we can turn even classification into generation because we can treat classification as generation and then everything is just generation and we can use GPT for that, right? How can we do that? It's a very simple trick. So we can convert any task, including classification, into text-to-text -text format. How can we do that? So for example, um, I would say, so machine translation is, cle is, is, uh, is clear. So you would basically take the text and the input would be input, translate English. Okay, so here's the input, translate English to German. That is good. So this is the input. And you're given instruction here, actually in the text, translate English to German, that is good. And the model should understand the task and then spit out the answer, that's good. Okay, yeah, it sounds easy, but you can do it even for classification, like uh, nature language inference, where you would say M, um, uh, MNLE premise, so this was the one of the texts, I hate pigeons, and then hypothesis, my feelings toward pigeons are filled with animosity. Interesting. And he would classify it uh, into entitlement. And now he expect that the, the model actually writes the text entitlement. You know, it doesn't tell you one or two or three or some other value. It just writes you verbatim the actual name of the label, right? So it just tells you it's entitlement. If you want to evaluate them, and maybe in your data set you had uh, entitlement was one and contradiction was two and uh, neutral was three. You would just have a, a mapping here. So entitlement. Uh, and you would just map it, map, map it back to, to the numbers and just do the evaluation on that. So it's very easy. If you can, you can, if you had a sentiment analysis, you would say, here's a, a movie review. And then you would write a movie review. And then the output would be negative. So basically you can treat everything as text to text, okay? Might be, you might be asking why, but when we come to the to the LLMs, to the GPT models of LLM, then you will understand why it's actually better than standard classification, okay? Any questions? All right, how about a break? Good, uh, seven minutes is enough. Let's start at half, okay. Okay, welcome back. Um, so we are talking about the, the difficulties of NLP. We're talking about the tasks. And we came to the question, or I came to the question, but we would came eventually to the question, how to make sure that our models are doing what we, what we want them to do, or how, how can we make sure that we are solving these tasks? So we're coming to evaluation. And we'll split it into, again, like evaluation of text classification and evaluation of text generation. And then we'll talk like generally of the trickiness of evaluation whatsoever. So um, if you haven't had machine learning before, if you had before, this is not new. If you haven't had, what you typically do with your data set? You split your data set into several parts. So let's say you have this, um, 50,000 movie reviews and you want to do evaluation on, you want to do experiments on this data set. So typically you split your data set into your, into the uh, training part and a test part. And maybe there's, there might be a validation part. What is it good for? So it should be self-explaining, right? So the training data is used for training your models. So you train a model whatever it means. Basically, you show the model the examples and the model should learn some patterns about all movie reviews, okay. Then you use maybe the validation data set for some sort of, you test it on the validation data set, kind of run on these new examples and see how it performs. 
and you want to you might want to change something in your in your model something i don't know like taking a larger model whatever it means or taking some other model some better so called hyperparameters or guess what anything so you run it again and test again on the validation data so then you can do this like uh, many times sort of like experimental and then when you're when you're when you're done and say like okay i achieved what i want to achieve on this validation set i'm going to use the train model and finally 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 test it on this test data right why are we doing this why this extra hassle why not just train and test here and train here and test again and get better and train here and test get again and get better why are we trying to do this validation sort of round and test it just once why I've learned the test data it like can it's... learn the test data okay just remember the thing the, the test case. no we're not training on the test data we're evaluating so if, if, we would, uh, if... if we would train on the whole data set if we would train on test data, then we would remember the test data. Okay, so number one, or this is like number zero. Okay, never train on test data. This is this is even though this is not number one. This is number zero. Like remember this. You can make a tattoo. Never train on test data. You would be surprised. How how many times it happens? <laughs> like, not for a reason, just for you, just overlook something and just oh, I train on the test data. Okay, well, so because then everything is kind of screwed because you can remember the test data by heart and you achieve like 100 percent accuracy or whatever. Okay, so never never train on test data. I would even say never touch the test data before like final evaluation for a different reason. Okay. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I mean, random assembly is a different story. I agree, but the first part I agree. Com I agree completely because then, even though if you don't train, if you you know, <laughs> like, okay, this is yeah, <laughs> I never, I never do this. Fine. But even then, if you do like training and evaluating the test data, then you might change something like the hyperparameters. So who knows what, a, who ever, haven't heard of hyperparameters, what, what it could be, hyperparameter. Does it ring a bell? Who doesn't know? Who doesn't know? Okay, so for example, we'll come to that later, hyperparameters. So, but for an example, if you have a, if you would have a, uh, well, we don't know deep learning yet, so, but, there is a thing called number of parameters in your model, okay? So that, and you know, like G GPT 1.7 billion parameters, you might have heard, have heard it. So the models have different sizes, so to say, and different depth. Uh, and you might want to change the depth of the model. So the, the size of the model is your hyperparameter. It's what you design. You say like, I'm going to build a model with billion parameters. And he said, no, 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 it's not enough. I'm going to build a model with 2 billion par parameters. So it's a, it's not a, parameter of the model, but it's your decision of the design or design decision of the model. We call it hyperparameters for some reason. It's like, it's hyper, it's more than just the parameters of the model which you train. And then if you if you achieve a score like on this test data, and then you say, well, I'm gonna change the model into like two billion parameters, you know, then you're optimizing for this task already, even by changing hyperparameters. So this is what you said, like you're, you can influence your model decision based on the test data. So you're over learning or um, overfitting to your test data, right? So no, there's another reason why we shouldn't do that. Any other idea? This is correct. I mean, underlying this makes sense, but in, in practice, why, we, why shouldn't we, why should we have this train validation test or train test split? Why should we have it? For, for very practical reasons. Yeah, you can. You have to compare on the same test data set. That's correct. No, it's a complete yeah, unknown uh, entity for the model. Then it's for everyone, for every model in the, in the train stage, uh, completely unknown. And that's like uh, common ground. Ah, okay. We're we're coming somewhere. Yeah. Um, 
to a sufficiently powerful model to just memorize if we train on the test data. Yeah, but that's so, that's what we solved. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that we don't want to do that. Absolutely, we agreed on that already. No, the point is, if so, imagine you build a system for. I don't know something like you wanna and you wanna uh, cats and dogs. Okay, cats and dogs. It's not NLP, but cats and dogs is simple. Like recognizing cats and dogs. You build a system, and you wanna deploy it to the to the to the world, so everybody can use the API and you know take a picture of a of a dog and cat and kind of see oh it's a dog it's a cat. It's a stupid example, but it's just an example. And but you don't know. What are the users going to do in the future with your model? You you cannot foresee the future. You cannot say like what you know. Is it going to be good or bad? And is my system going to be good or bad? So you're kind of simulating here. What you're typically trying to do is also also to simulate sort of like time dimension, where you take this training as a historical data. And you take this as a future data, so to say. So you're trying to predict how your system will act in the future. So for example, you can split your data set. If you're splitting your data set to train and test, take all the pictures of cats and dogs like from 1950 to 2022 and take 2023 as your test data because it's the best way of simulating how it will behave in the real world where there could be some sort of shift in the data set, how dogs and cats were looking in the in the past versus in the future. Is it clear? Everybody's with me? Or okay, here's an example. Uh, if you if you were classifying news or entities, extraction entities from news, okay, so it could be entities, persons, and locations and things like that. Obviously, persons change in the news. You know, who who knew about Olaf Scholz? Like, no, <laughs> it's a bad example. Okay, something some someone knew in the politics in German politics who was unknown and now it's like a very famous somebody. Okay, I don't know. I don't know that much about German politics. Anyway, so if you have like you know if you if your system perfect you know pro, you know works well for entities which are known but then doesn't work for entities which it didn't see before like the names, then it's obviously wrong. So you want to you want to simulate it. So you would basically take your data set also. And try to split it and, um, in a way that it kind of mimics the future performance, okay? Like uh, for uh, diseases in the news, you know, nobody knew about COVID nineteen before twenty twenty, and then it was full of the news, right? So there is a shift in the in the domain, and you want to make it somehow more ro robust, you know, for the future, okay? So we're good. So and the validation, I mean, we talked about it, but this is something you, you can really know. Uh, if you are thinking about like a cool tattoo, this could be one. Um, okay. Then, if your data set is small and you still want to do some of this train test or train validation test, you can uh, you can do something called cross validation, which basically it's a simple idea. You you partition your data into number of chunks, like k. So here we have k is one, two, three, four, five. So k equals 5, so k chunks. And then you iterate k times over the data set, and each time um, you assign different train and test data, right? You, you, assign, you split it differently. So in this, we call it fault. So in the first fault, you take the first four buckets as a, as a training data. So this will be your training data, and this will be your maybe test or validation data set. And then in the next fault, you're going to assign randomly another not randomly. I mean, the random random shuffling should be in there um, before you start. But then you assign the, this fault and train on this data set and test on the other part. So basically, it, it helps you kind of to learn better generalization and not having this fixed test data, but having the test data over overall your the whole data set, which might not be that large. Um, there's a reason in, in in the theory of statistic learning and machine learning why this is this is good and interesting in which circumstances, but typically nowadays you don't you could you could do that and people are doing that for some tasks which have small data set but if you have like a half a billion uh, sorry half a million points, 
then you might not do that. And typically also data sets nowadays have a, these train validation tests kind of given. You know, if you download the IMDB, there is a train data set and test data set. And you might want to do cross validation just on the training data to, hyper, uh, to train your hyperparameters, but the test data is given. So there are two different approaches, but you should know about what cross validation means. Okay, any questions to cross validation? So this could be also not test or validation. So however you treat it, but basically you train on part and then you test on the other part and you shuffle that a couple of times and maybe you average, okay? So no questions? Sounds good. Now we're, so it was easy. <laughs> like evaluation of text classification. Now we have to, so we are talking about how to split the data set and now how to actually evaluate your predictions, okay. So let's start with something very simple. It's a binary classification where we have uh, two classes. Okay, so sanity check, what is the data set for uh, doing binary classification in LP? Everybody should try when having a model. What's the name of the data set? What should you use for doing binary classification? Something like uh, MNIST, but different for NLP. The IMDB data set, okay. Yeah, IMDB data set is this binary case, movie reviews. So, and here we have two classes, positive and negative, which you might label as typically you would use zero and one, but it's arbitrary. You could, it could be like any number, one and minus one or whatever. But typically we use negative zero and positive as one. Typically, it's a, it's a design choice. And then, you take your test data, so you have a trained model, you take, take your test data, and then take each of these examples at a time and try to predict the label, okay? So you have a trained model. This is a trained model. And this is your test data set, where you have text and label for each entry in your test data set. And you take the model, take each entry and predict the label. So, and then you put it into this so-called confusion matrix. If the actual GOAT label, so this is X is actual or GOAT label is if the actual label so what is in this database, if this actual label was negative and your model predicted that this text is negative, you add one here, one true negative. So this is what, what's called true negative. So it was negative and you, you truly said it's negative, okay? Then if your label was actually negative, but your model said, well, actually this text is positive, you add one here. If the actual label was positive here in the data set and your model says, oh, it's negative, you increase score here in this matrix. And if the positive label was gold and your model says, oh, it's positive, you add one here. Does it make sense? This is very important, seems easy, but it's easy to screw up also for some reasons. Okay, so that's that's how you do that. Basically, you take one after each other and fill in the confusion matrix here and here and all of them, like you would end up with uh, 100, not 100 entries, you would end up with um, with values and it will sum up, sum up to all the numbers in your test data set, okay? The thing is, so we have positive year and negative year and negative year and positive year, but the ordering of columns and rows is arbitrary. So you can just flip these two and it's fine. It will, you know, it will work the same. So like you can say in this first, first row will be positive and the second will be negative. And also you can flip these columns or you can even like transpose the matrix and having the predictions on, you know, on the, uh, as rows and uh, the true ones as a, as a columns. If you look for, for example, in Wikipedia, I guess they have like this, this matrix transpose. So it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter where your things are because it's it's just, you know, a mapping. Like 
if if the actual gold label was negative and your prediction was negative, you know where to put it in the matrix. Doesn't matter on the ordering of columns and rows. Okay, this is important to remember. Like this is arbitrary. So there is no single correct way of how confusion matrix must be look where the true negatives, true positives, false positives, and false negatives must be in the matrix. They could be anywhere depending on the ordering on the columns. I'm making this very explicit and very clear because it's easy to mess up or kind of believe, oh, yeah, confusion matrix does just look like that. No, it's not. It's how you design it, how, where you put your, your columns and rows. It's arbitrary decision, okay? So arbitrary, very important. So if somebody asks you, oh, here's a confusion matrix, can you give me uh, something, some measure out of it? You need to understand, okay, but what these columns mean, like what is this and what is this? Once you understand, you can, you can kind of give me the answer, okay? So this is important to know. Okay, any question to this kind of creating the confusion matrix? Well, I have a question, why? Why, <laughs> why do we do that? Like, if you have a confusion matrix from the binary classification, what can we do with that? So what, what would you do with that? I mean, we have a matrix, which we have some numbers. So maybe for our data set, here would be like uh, maybe 100. Here would be like two. Here would be like 905. And here is just zero. What can we do with that? Okay, I'll stop you here. Okay, cool. So this is like two answers in one answer already. So exactly. So you can compute the thing. You, you mentioned one word. It's accuracy. So you can compute a single value, which tells you something about the performance of your, of your model, which is, for instance, accuracy. So it's a, it's a measure of evaluation. So it's one value. And you also said an interesting thing. You can look in the type of errors you're getting. Exactly. Because then you see like, it's called confusion matrix for a reason, because the model confused here, confused the, the true negative, confused into positive. Oh, okay, the confusion is here. So the model is actually confusing the negatives into positives. So you can explore more in the model and it gives you more understanding where the errors are coming from. Okay, this is interesting, cool. And you can do the metrics. And this is actually, uh, you know, this is actually what you can do. So you can compute several metrics using this confusion matrix, as well as look into more the, the type of errors you're getting. And actually, if you come from other any other fields like statistics or biomedicine, these are the like type one error, type two errors. And, uh, and we are using some metrics which are interviews, they're using different metrics. You might remember if you, if you still remember the pandemic, I tried to forget everything, but there was also discussions like, what's the efficiency of the test and what's the false recall of the test and stuff like that. It's everything is based on the confusion matrix. Once you understand how confusion matrix works, you can compute all these, you know, on Wikipedia, like 20 different metrics, which you can compute. So once you understand that, you know what's going on. So confusion metrics, basically it's the blueprint where all the metrics are coming from. Okay. So what is the most, the most, say, common metric we can use. So we are interested in how many times we were right. <laughs> this is like, how many times was it? Okay, here we were right. It means the label matched the prediction. Here we were wrong, right, right, wrong, wrong, right. Where is this information in the confusion matrix for these, these parts? So where do we know we are right or wrong? Where do we know we are right? So, okay, here. True negative. Were we right? Yes, we are right. Here, we are wrong. Here, we are wrong. And here, we are right. Ah, awesome. So what if we take the diagonal, sum it up, and this would be the ratio, and, and sum it up and divide by all the, the size of the data set, we would end up with accuracy. Is it, is it correct? Does it make sense? because we have everything on the diagonal. So we sum them up, 100 and 905 divided by 100 plus 905 plus two plus zero. And this is our accuracy. This is how many times we were wrong and, and right. We did it very tricky, you know, in the confusion matrix, you can do it just, just counting 
hit or miss when you're just doing that, right? You can do it in a much easier than the confusion matrix, but using this, and we can give it a name. So it's the sum of the true negatives and false positives divided by the all together. But if you think about it, it's just the, the diagonal over everything, then it's, then it's fine. So here's a fa very, fa <laughs> very fancy way of computing accuracy of a classifier. So the, the, the test set T, okay, what is, what is this? What is the symbol in this parenthesis and this parenthesis saying? What is was it? If I set if I have set T, then what is what is this? Yeah, the number of elements. Yeah, exactly. It has a name. It's called cardinality in set theory. It's the size of the set. Okay, cool. Yeah, good. So what is, so we're summing, okay, we're summing over the, the set. That's interesting, over the test data. What is this very fancy function i? So very fancy function i. So what is, okay, what is this? This is the GOAT label. Label. And this fxi is the prediction. So we want to compare whether they match. So this very function, very fancy function i is the identity function, which is if uh, which is one if these two match, and is zero if these don't match. Yeah, so i goes to zero if if uh, f x i is not equal to y i. And it's one if fxi equals to yi, right? It's just so basically we are here, we're getting one or zero for the hit or miss. It's very fancy mathematical definition, but that's why I asked you yesterday, you know, are you scared of math? Because you know, some things can be super formalized, but made for a reason. Yes. Is that source use that notation? I guess so. No, it's not the identity function, we call it. Here. I mean, the identity is the identity. So the value in have the same value out. That's not. Oh, OK. Yeah. OK. So they call it like that. So I, I know it from the from from maybe this one and from the, it's coming maybe from different communities. Well, because people in probabilistic machine learning, they call it the identity function. So it's a different community and they use different names for maybe different or same names for different stuff. Anyway. So we're counting all the all the hit or misses and divide it and make a make an average, like divided by the number of, of all this. So again, here, what it means, if this were our confusion matrix, we would just sum up sum up um, where we are, right? So this would be like the number of where we where we have uh, the match of the gold label and the prediction and divided by number of uh, y by the by the number of. Um, the elements and it gives us accuracy of 1.0. Yes. The source calls them indicator function. Indicator function. Oh, okay. Indicator, not yeah. identity. Thank you. Indicator. Apologies. Indicator function. Okay. So uh, we would end up with uh, accuracy. So the accuracy is basically how many how many percent times we are right or not. This is very easy, right? Um, okay, this is the most kind of interesting or interesting, mo most easy way to implement and to look at a problem. But it ignores these two things. This, you know, these predictions are ignoring the accuracy. So they play a role. And that's why we use something called precision recall and FF1 score. And again, here's a formula how you can how you compute precision and recall and F1 score. So uh, let me just fast forward. Okay. So because then we have to so precision and recall and F1 score they are not global. They are related to one class. Like accuracy is for the whole confusion matrix. If you say like, oh my problem has accuracy of 97, then you know accuracy is you know for all the classes in your data set. But precision relates to actual class. So precision for class here positive, 
will be different than a precision for class negative. So this is something to, to remember. There is no single, if I show you a confusion matrix and I ask you what's a precision and you would give me a number, I would say, no, <laughs> sorry. No, you should have asked precision for what? Because they're different. Okay. Typically, typically, you might say it's precision for the positive one, typically, but it's just an arbitrary decision. So be very clear what you report. So how you compute the precision? So precision for class positive. Okay, we're here. So we're taking the number of hit, hits, so the two positive here, and we divided it by the number of false positives and true positives. All right, so this is, this is how we compute it. So it's ignoring the, the negatives completely, but it's saying, um, if, I, if my classifier said it's positive, how many times of that it was correct? Okay, so my classifier said it's positive, but it might have been wrong. So how many times if I said positive, was it really positive? This is what precision is telling me, right? Any questions on precision? You don't have to remember this TP, FP, and so on, but you have to somehow know what it means. So I guess we should get, you know, we should try to exercise it next week a little bit so we understand what it means. The same for recall. So for class positive, I'm taking again the number of hits. Maybe I have different colors. Oh, I do. Okay, cool. Can you see that? Oh, beautiful. So recall for class positive is the number of true positives again, but then divided by the number of all the positives in the data set, right? So it's saying like, okay, in, in the data set, there's so many positives. How many of them were classified as such by, the, by my classifier, right? How many, how many did I find? How, how many of them I recalled from the data set correctly? And these two, precision and recall, are two different, two different evaluation metrics. Like they they do something different. Precision is telling me if I say it's precision, it's pre, uh, if I say it's positive, how many times I'm, I'm right. Recall is saying how many of these positives I was able to identify. And it has something to do with the how unbalanced your data set is. If you have just uh, if your data set is skewed, which means you have just very few positives and many negatives, then it plays a role. And I guess we should try to really like hands-on exercise next week to see the differences, like you know how it how these metrics behave. So then, and you have two you get like two different numbers. You know, you have a precision and recall for one class, but there's two numbers. Each of them, by the way, in uh, interval of. Uh, Zero, zero to one. Oh, where's my blue? Here. Better. Zero to one. Uh, you might be asking, what if the current case is? Like, if this is all zero, so well, you have to take an arbitrary, arbitrary decision, but typically it doesn't it doesn't happen. So you wanna you wanna know, like, okay, was my overall uh, metric taking into account precision and recall together, and it's called F1 score. And again, it's in this case, this is for class positive. You know? So it will be different for the class negative. The formula is the same, obviously, but the number will be different. You know? And you take two times precision times recall over precision plus recall. So it's a, uh, they call it like a harmonic mean. Basically. So you kind of average these two together. And you get, again, like a number in uh, between zero and one. So one is the perfect, if you have like F1 score of one, you solve the problem or you cheated with the test data. So maybe you just learn on the test data. So don't do that, right? So these are the metrics and it will be different a little bit for the negative class. So then you might have F1 score for each of the classes and then you can kind of do some average or macro micro averaging. But any questions to this uh, precision recall and fun score? This is a very important concept you have to understand because it's the core of the evaluation of, of any classifier. Anything what you do in machine learning, there is some evaluation. Either accuracy, 
and mostly precision and recall and fun score. In NLP, this is mostly that. In other areas of machine learning, it will be something different. Could be a loss, could be... Uh, in, in drug testing, it's sensitivity and specificity, for instance, and they all of them use the confusion matrix by confusing something else. So sensitivity and specificity are terms from drug testing. But we're using precision recall and fun score here. And now we might be asking, okay, if I if I have like more more classes in my data set, can I use the same same approach? And the answer is yes, obviously. You can just use your confusion matrix again for multi-class. So here, I guess this is from um, from a data set of text classification into um, topics. So I think it is like 20 news groups data set, if I'm not mistaken, but there's there's more classes. I just pick up the, a little bit of that. And we have a classes uh, of the document. So each document is associated with a single class. So it could be either money, uh, about trade, about interest, about wheat, corn, and grain. So something from the news like uh, 30 years back. And here's uh, a hypothetical confusion matrix. Um, and now we can see pretty pretty clearly, which we, you were talking about, like the, the, not, the errors which we can get. So how can we compute accuracy here? How do, how do we compute accuracy? Think about it a little bit. You. We take all the trans will be well right, which is like the diagonal. Yeah. And then we uh, divide it by all the sample size. Yeah. OK. Makes sense. Exactly. The same as we had like with two classes. Now we have multiple, but you take a diagonal. OK. How do we compute? Precision of interest. Well, I don't know. I don't remember the formula, but it's I'm looking at precision of interest. So I'll take maybe where I set interest and it was interest. Oh, the precision will be zero because we we completely missed it. Okay, interesting. What will be the precision of let's say wheat? So I look here. So it will be how many times? How was the precision? How many times? My classifier said it was it was wheat, which is thirty times, and how many times it was really correct over that I would say I would say I have to always double check that I mean Wikipedia is her friend so because the, the matrices could be arbitrary so sometimes you see recall as taking the row and sometimes as a as a column because you know the ordering of the matrix and where the predictions are versus where the actual data it differs it's arbitrary so there will be some different precision anyway but we also see here and that's why confusion matrix is interesting for exploring errors is that actually, so if you look at the categories, corn and grain, they seem, if, if you have documents about corn and documents about grain, they might contain similar things. And maybe that's why your classifier actually was confused and assigned only 10 of them, who were, which were actually about grain to grain and assigned um, some others to maybe to wheat. Oh, even this is wrong. Okay, so then we understand our classifier actually doesn't confuse documents about grain with uh, trading. Yeah, okay, this is good. But it has, it struggles with the nuances with uh, wheat versus grain and a little bit of interest. Oh, this is interesting. This shouldn't happen and so on. So the confusion matrix give you a little bit more quantitative insight into the errors, not qualitative. For qualitative, you have to look into the data, actually compare what's going wrong, which is manual work. But here you can kind of zoom out and understand a little bit more where the errors are coming from. Um, very often they're colored, and then you can very sometimes see rows and um, columns that are brighter or darker. And then They're colored? Sometimes. OK. People want to display data very prettily. Yeah, I mean, okay. If you do, if you want to do fancy visualization, you can you can kind of um, use a uh, yeah, like a gra grades uh, grading sh you know shade grading and uh, and show that uh, pretty clearly. Yeah, yeah. And then you can you can see for example there are, there are like blocks. You can see there's like a block. Exactly. Yeah, interesting. I don't have an example here, but it makes sense. If you, I think you can do it like with a heat. So you basically put it into a heat map in pandas. Uh, which is a so pandas is a like plotting library 
and you can create heat map from a data frame. And if you put like confusion matrix as data frame into, into heat map, you can visualize that. And this will be like peaks here. And then you will say here maybe will be a little bit darker because there's lots of confusion. Makes sense. Yeah. But even like without this fancy visualization, it's very helpful to understand a little bit of errors. And you will know how to compute precision recall for each class and the F1 score and for the whole setup. OK, any questions? Cool. So confusion matrix. We can unambiguously compute precision recall for each class. Now the question, how to get the F1 score for the complete test score across classes? We have, and now we are getting into like a, you know, um, a rabbit hole. So we can take score, F1 score for each class. So for instance, we would take F1 score for corn. We can do it, you know, precision and recall. Then we can take F1 score for all these. And then we take the average of these F1 scores. Or we can compute precision for class one and recall for class one and precision for class two and recall for class two. I mean, we need it anyway. But then we can take the average precision and average recall and then say that F1 score will be two times PR over P plus R. Like First computing the averages and then making the final F1 score. And you'll be wondering, like, are they the same? And they're not. <laughs> so the way you compute your final, you know, final F1 score, it really depends on the on the on the um, distribution of the data set. And you come to different conclusions. So what I'm saying, why I'm saying this is um, you have to be very clear what you're what you're reporting. Don't trust just a library. I mean, you can trust a library. So use a scikit-learn uh, confusion matrix, and you just call it, and it gives you confusion matrix, and you call it a day. Well, without understanding what actually is it computing, how can you tell? I mean, you have to, you have to know. Okay. There is a beautiful paper actually comparing this to, and it's called Apples to Apples. And if you're interested in evaluation, you should read it because they show there are different and it could be the difference could be really high depending on the data set. Anyway, so report exactly what you do. You should, you should really understand what the confusion matrix is doing. And I guess next week we could actually implement a confusion matrix and try to try different, you know, a couple of different fake classifiers and to see how different these results could be. It could be interesting. What do you, what do you think? We might do that. Okay. We're coming to the end. We'll finish right on time. No worries. Okay. Now, okay, evolution of classification is easy, but how do you evaluate text generation? Oh, okay. This is going to be complicated. Mm. So here's what is it? Okay. Yeah. Because there's even more generation tasks than we talk about, like summarization, machine translation. Question answering, okay, we, we had this, we had machine translation, we had summarization already, question answering, okay, we had that, question generation, okay, so you can generate a question if you have an article, interesting. Dialogue generation, we covered already. Image captioning, oh, it's also interesting. So it's more like multimodal, you see a picture and then you wanna generate a caption of the picture. Okay, cool task, interesting. Data to text, okay, this is also interesting task. So for instance, what could be data to text? Do you have any cool idea what is data to text could be like a task where you have data in some structure format you want to generate text? Uh, like this new, uh, they call it uh, the new function of ChatGPT, uh, which can put data sets into uh, analysis. Okay, yeah, that's is this is already very fancy, but okay, I see. Anything like more? Yeah, in the back. Sorry, go, yeah, go ahead, continue. I was thinking about um, using the image and this uh, explain what it is. Okay, yeah, this is, yeah, yeah, I agree. This is very fancy to be honest, like super fancy models, multimodal and stuff like that. Like data to text could be, for example, um, uh, news uh, weather reporting. So because weather reports typically are in the table data and you want to create a text or 
um, like football match reporting as a text. So, well, football match basically you have a table data who's playing in whom and who who just showed a you know who just scored or who not, and you can generate text uh, basically from this data and make it lively and so on. So you may be generating text from data in a in a in a game, like a you know a, a commentary in a game like a FIFA or whatever. But I don't know. It's an example. So there's more. Okay. So. Um, evaluating text generation is hard because of the reasons we we're talking in the first half of the lecture. Because how do you tell? How can you tell two sentences are the same if they are not the same on the surface? I mean, if they match completely, if they match one to one, it's like yes. But typically not because you can say the same thing in so many different ways. So here's an here's a part of the table from uh, from this paper from the survey on evaluation in metrics in natural language generation systems. And this is not to scare you. This is just to show you, like, as compared to text classification, where you have confusion matrix and all these metrics and you're good, if you generate text, it's much more trickier. And there's so many different metrics and scores you can employ for different tasks, and they have pros and cons. Some of them are have been here for, for years. Some of them are, are new. And they come with their own kind of um, assumption about the text. Okay, so it's very tricky, and we're gonna just touch a couple of them. So you should you should know at least a few of them, like the baselines. But this is a part of active research, like how to evaluate that you know whatever you generate is similar to what you generated with what you have in your gold standard data, like machine translation, right? You have one reference translation, and you generate something similar. Well. And then you, different, you generate something very very different. So how can you tell like this one is better than the other? So it's a tricky question. So one metric, automatic, I'm talking about automatic metrics. Like here, this is everything automatic. Like you can ask people to kind of judge everything in your data set, but it doesn't scale. So you need something like a confusion matrix, which you can run automatically and over time and multiple times when you develop your system and get the metrics, and if you improve the metrics, your system is improving, right? So the, the, the metric should be a good proxy for evaluation of your system. If you get better accuracy, yeah, the system is probably getting better. If you get better F1, F1 score, the system is better for solving this task. So you need some something here as well, some, some metric, like if you get better score in one of those, then your system is actually generating better text, whatever it means in the context of the task. So, so one of them is, I guess the oldest one now, is the blue bilingual evolution understanding. So the blue score, blue, I think it's, it's French somehow. So it sounds French to me at least. So. And it's like the most popular metric for evolution of machine translation systems. So you should know. I mean, if I ask you, how can you evaluate your machine, uh, machine translation? You would say, yeah, I, uh, I would start with blue score. Said, yeah, sure, you, you should start with blue score. It's bad, but it's the baseline everybody's using. Like it's not perfect. It has really like you know drawbacks, but it works out of box and it's very easy to implement. So it's precision-based metric to compute the engram overlap between the reference, so the reference is gold standard, and the hypothesis. So this is what you generate. Okay. So let's let's try again. What is an engram? Okay, this is a good question. Anybody knows what what an engram could be? So let's say bigram. What is a bigram? It's two words after each other. So, for example, this is the bigram. Oh, this is a bigram. Okay. What could be a trigram? It's three words. So, this is a trigram. Okay. N is just a placeholder. So, n gram is like a, typically we're using like unigram. And, okay. Interesting word. Unigram. It's just a single word, okay? So bigrams is like a two words in a context and trigram it's just three consecutive words. So, okay, so we, it's computes a precision-based metric. Also, we know what is precision that computes the n-gram overlap between the reference and the hypothesis. So you take the, the number of overlapping n-grams and divide it by the total number of n-grams in the hypothesis, okay? So basically you take your 
you take your text, generate your, your hypothesis, your generated text, chunk it into n-grams, chunk your hypothesis into n-grams, and then compute the precision among these two. That's that simple. No. But it's a precision-based metric, so you might be missing quite a lot. So it doesn't take recall into action. If you forget to translate something, you get good precision but low recall. So ah, uh, yeah, okay. There's uh, as I said, it's not perfect, but it's one of the one of the metrics. Any question to to blue? I mean, you. Sh I I'm not asking you. You should be able to implement it right away, you know. But you should be able to understand how how it measures the evaluation. Okay, so it takes the engrams from reference and hypothesis and computes the precision on that. If, if you know what precision is, then you just, you can compute blue, okay? So then there's another one, which is again, like a French name, Rouge, <laughs> interesting. And it's the same as blue, but now it's computing, the, again, the engram matches, but it computes a, a recall, okay? So now you again, chunk your text into engrams, your hypothesis, and your reference text and computer recall between these two. And there's also variant Rouge L, which measures the long, longest common subsequence. Okay, so this is another, another metric. And blue and Rouge are just two most commonly used metrics for text generation, where you have a reference and compare your generation to that. And you should report both if you do anything with text generation. And then there's all these you know, much advanced techniques. Any question to Rouge and blue? Okay. And I think we're we're going to finish soon. So we're talking about automatic evaluation. And now we are always we had always the assumption that we have the gold standard data. You know, we have some ground truth which is hundred percent correct. And this assumption makes sense when humans highly agree on the answer. So for example, if I ask you like, can you label whether this image or not contain a bird? Yeah, I mean, if you see a bird in the image, there is a bird. If there is no bird, you would say like, no. Like 99.9% .9 of the time, you would agree with other people. Or is learn a verb? Yeah, it is, of course. It could be something else also. No, it's a verb, yeah. What is the capital of Italy? Everybody agrees, it's, uh, it's Rome, right? So, but this assumption often doesn't make sense, especially when language is involved, as we saw. So for example, if you were, if you were hired by Facebook to label toxic comments, this is the worst job ever on the planet, so you don't wanna do it, but somebody has to do it in order to build machines to do it automatically. But saying whether a comment is toxic or not, this is very subjective. Even if you like show thousands of examples, what is a toxic comment? You see something on Twitter say, or is it fake news? Like, is it fake news or not? And you read it like, I have no idea. It could be, maybe, and so on. It's very ambiguous. So the gold truth is kind of unknown in many cases. So there is a human label variation and maybe it's not a problem but it's, a, it's, it's not a bug, maybe it's a feature and we should somehow utilize it. So there's a nice paper from Barbara Planck last year at the uh, MNLP, kind of summarizing this problem of not having go through label and maybe you know, our models should kind of finally utilize this variation in, in language. But most like 99% task we are solving that they, they have like a go through, although they don't like in reality, but we model this as they, there is one go through and we're optimizing towards the technique, towards you know the accuracy on this task, but we're kind of ignoring you know, the, the, the nitty gritty details. So it's important to keep that in mind. Like, yeah, the, the data set somebody decided and somebody labeled the data in a way, but it might not be always right. And in many cases on these, in these data sets, like we, we talk about, there's gold standard labels where if you read it, they're just plain wrong. Like the movies, like it, there, there's like wrong labels. And if you, or image recognition, there's there's errors. People do errors in annotating and there's subjectivity in there. So human annotators are biased, okay? So um, 
if you if you let somebody write data for you so for example the stanford uh nature language inter in, uh, inference corpus so they people wrote these examples by hand and if you ask people to write something they kind of project their own biases and they kind of get translated to or transferred to the data set so humans are biased we have cognitive biases and then the data set are biased too so if you have you know concerns about diversity especially when workers freely generate sentences and if your data set is biased because it comes from a particular group of people then the model strain on this data set do not really generalize well on data that would come from differently biased group of people you know so the bias is inherent in the data sets as well because humans are biased so it's a bias in nlp is a big topic and it maybe starts even with the data set as we as we have them okay and also data sets can be solved by not solving the problem but solving a an artifact in the data and i have hands-on experience on that so we created a data set that was about reasoning in language whatever reasoning in argument so you would have a description uh, i'm not gonna go into details but you would basically solve it by kind of understanding the world some like common sense reasoning and it was super hard back then even even now i guess uh, for machines to understand it and solve this task was binary task whether whether and yes or no so binary task and the system were getting like 50 percent accuracy like random and then the best system were scoring like 70 percent accuracy and and we thought like oh okay these models are actually good because they're solving the task right and then come uh tim niven and and his colleague they published a paper later a year later showing well actually you have so many um, artifacts in the spurious statistics, so artifacts in the data, which help the models to, to get better scores, but not solving the task. And we're, we have negatives. So in our data set, we have, if, if there was don't, it was a strong signal for the model to be labeled as one or, or zero, one of those. So just basically looking into whether there is a negation or not in the, in the sentence, you could achieve 70% accuracy on the task without actually solving anything about a task, without understanding what is this reasoning about. So artifacts in data and, and spurious statistics, it's also a big issue, right? So maybe you should, you know, if you try a new, if you design a new, new task and you run a model and say like, oh, 80% accuracy, it's better than 50% chance, maybe 80%, we're solving the task and our model is really good, then I would say, yeah, so really look into data and look for some these spurious correlations or some some artifacts. Maybe you have some. Like uh, you can solve the task by so I think there was yeah, there 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 was a system for cancer detection. It was images. Cancer detection. Um it's not an urban legend, but I don't remember details about it. I heard it like years back. They they were able to detect images like cancer um X uh, X-ray images of cancer. And their system were scoring like 80%, 90% accuracy. And it's like, wow, our system is really working. And later they found that the, the images that were positive had the tiny little logo of the of the of the lab on the left hand corner. And the models actually were picking up on this on this kind of uh, something completely unrelated to the task. We're basically scoring where well, is it coming from this uh, from this hospital or not? <laughs> something like that. I mean, <laughs> yeah, okay, sure. Uh, that's uh that's not how you solve the problem, right? So artifacts in data sets are, are, are hard. Okay, so recap what we learned today. That NLP is challenging, but fun. There is a lots of tasks and data set and they're hard to create because data quality matters. So we need to understand the data. We need to understand the annotators, are they biased? It, everything matters. It's very important to be familiar with the common evolution metrics, such as accuracy, precision, recall, F1 score, blue score, rouge score, and I, that's it. And getting better scores is just the yeah, beginning of, story, of the story. And as we saw, like generation, text generation, and evolution is really an art, so it's, it's, it's a science. Having said that, I would say, if you, have, if you don't have any other questions, I would say thank you and as usual, the slides are new on, on GitHub. Any questions? Okay, so I would say let's uh, let's see you next week, and uh, we'll we'll 
take it online like what we're going to do like on the exercise we discuss on Discord maybe next week. All right. So thanks.